Hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our today's lecture, sorry for the delay which was <laughs> me trying to perfect everything till the last moment and it ended how it ended, uh, so we lost a bit of time. <clears throat> uh, today's lecture will stop, uh, drop the intro because it's uh, to not lose you know, more any more time. Uh, today we'll discuss very important aspect, which is Markov chain Monte Carlo, which generally leads us to how to understand uh, the diagnostics that we are doing to the uh, to our inferences. Uh, today we will discuss basics of Mont Markov chain Monte Carlo. I will record the video of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and uh, put it over the weekend for you to watch. Uh, and that will be f finalize us the understanding of what's go actually going on uh, in our uh, in our computation process. So, uh, any first the question to you: Can you hear me? You can answer it either on this chat or on the uh, uh, on the uh, Teams chat. Either way is okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so, without any further ado. No intro, it will be added later to the edited version. Uh, Markov chains. Markov chain is... Uh, everybody heard about it, not uh, necessarily everyone knows what's going on. Uh, the main point of Markov chains is the uh, general idea of uh, wandering around, uh, around space of uh, some kind of parameters by transitioning from one point to another and generally it means that there is a probability distribution that conditional on where are we located so in the point Q gives a, generates uh, us a space of places where we can go with assigned probability so the main point uh, the Markov here comes from the Markov process which is that uh, only our current location decides on our movement later. So we do not need the sequence of all points from the start. We need only the point we are here. And of course, we need our transition procedure. Uh, the most uh, uh, the Markov processes that you already know and you have connected with are all the dynamical systems that you use in control theory, because in a sense, all of them observe the, the uh, state evolution pr uh, process, which is the generally the Markov property. But Markov property also considers the stochastic system, so it's more general. Uh, so if we have our parameter space and we want we want a transition that with certain probability uh, moves from one point to another randomly. So we have this distribution that assigns us the uh, probability of movement from one point to another. Okay. Uh, so the most uh, the easiest way would be an example for that. So we want a transition that will be in a two-dimensional space, and this two-dimensional space is the um, uh, of generally you know, uh, vector numbers q1 and q2, and we will consider the transition from one uh, uh, from initial to the next point. Our probability of transition from one point to another, so our distribution of uh, of moment, will be normal distribution. And this normal distribution uh, will be independent in each of the axes. So generally, we will move. It's kind of like a diagonal dynamical systems in uh, control theory, where each of axes kind of works separately. In this case, we just change our coordinates as uh, movement from one point to another using normal distribution. In a sense, it will work like this: that we will sample a normal value from uh, for given sigma, uh, with mean located in the um, uh, in the previous point. So our uh, so we will be moving to a point that is uh, using the distribution normal distribution, 
um, centered are our previous points. So the farther away we'll be, the lower probability will be to move there. And to uh, make it more, let's say, um, edible for you or understandable, or hopefully more clear, uh, we'll just see it as a code. So we start at point zero zero. We will generate fifty po uh, possible uh, places we can go, so we can see how such movement happens. We will use sigma equal to one, so it won't be uh, difficult. We assign a seed, so it will be more. Uh, generally, it's a good practice. Supposedly, this way of assigning seed in Python is now becoming more and more depreciated, but the current method for me is not... Uh, it's at the moment, the API for random number generation in NumPy is, in my opinion, very obfuscating what's going on. And so, so we generate a vector of possible queues, which will be a, um, a matrix of uh, 50 points, uh, 50 vectors, uh, two-dimensional vectors that are be, will be on mm, uh, assigned using normal distributions with a mean of previous point and individual arrays in each of us. It's not a multinomial distribution, normal distribution. It's just a select, uh, generator of uh, two normal vectors, uh, vectors of, no, of normal distribution numbers. Uh, so starting with our point zero zero, we have a possible set of points that we can move to. These are the 50 points, and as you can see, it's relatively easy where we can wander with our... Uh, actually, these are places that we can go, and selecting one, one of them, actually, the, here we are just selecting the first one from the, the 50. Uh, in practice, it would be any kind of way would be okay in this, and we just need to randomly transfer to one of the, those points, and uh, such transition is here, so we are moving from 0, 0 to here. So our movement is uh, our movement is clearly visible. So uh, this was the first movement, so first transition, randomly uh, random movement to a point that is lock, uh, that distribution of those points is in this case centered in the uh, previous point. So it's conditional on the on the previous point. Uh, movement from this point, of course, gives us uh, new options of transitions. Uh, and possible transitions are uh, located here, so starting from uh, 0, 0, we can move to these points. Uh, level 0, 0, from this, the, this new new point, we can move here. These are our, 50, again, 50 possible movements. We could, of course, the entire space is possible. It just gives us where well, they're most concentrated. And uh, this is something wrong. Wait a second. This shouldn't happen this way. Like. Those are typical situations. Realization initial point. Yes. Okay. Possible trans from first transition. And um, I've probably messed something up. Oh. Okay. 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 I. Sorry. My bad. This should be here. Whoa. I did something really bad. <laughs> Sorry. Just this should be okay. I have no idea what happened here. Let's just run it again just to be safe. So numbers possible transitions, selected first transition here, new possible transitions from point Q1, and selection of point Q2, which should be here and Okay, I have not regenerated it. I did. So what's going on? Ha! This is the... That's regenerated here. 
Okay, now it works. So we've just like f no idea what happened. Uh, so in a sense, this is the. This will be edited out, <laughs> so don't worry about it. Uh, so the first uh, the transition from the first transition we started at zero zero here. We've moved here, then we move here. Uh, so that's how generally the Markov chain operates. So we randomly move in some kind of way. This is actually the uh, random wandering Markov process, but generally the idea is that we, with some probability, move somewhere else. We can define Markov process also discreetly, Markov chain discreetly, so it will just move to uh, finite sequence of uh, fi finite number of, of possibilities. Uh, it's like a finite state machine that we are moving from one point to another in order to get somewhere. So the Markov chain of course will be a sequence of transitions moving from one point to another so our next point will be uh, determined through the uh, through the distribution centered in Q0, the second point will be inserted in our Q1 and such sequence uh, that is a Markov chain. So n points starting from 1 to, to n something for, uh, initially. Okay. Why we are interested in Markov chains? Because as we uh, you could see on my pre previous lecture that was recorded on the um, Markov uh, on the uh, Monte Carlo method, we want to sample our distributions because of multiple advantages, but Mark classical Monte Carlo is difficult in multidimensional spaces. Markov chain do not have those problems in moving around multidimensional spaces, and moreover, there is a way of generating samples from any kind of distribution using Markov chains. Because for each Markov chain, uh, or we, uh, or generally, from we can construct a Markov chain that will have uh, such situation that expectation of tr our transition distribution will be uh, over uh, over first will be our new new distribution. It's called a stationary or invariant distribution of a Markov transi uh, transition distribution. What does it mean in practice terms? In practice terms, it means that if we have a well-behaved Markov chain it will have a unique stationary distribution and the stationary typical set of Markov chain will be a typical set of that distribution. So we generally will get what we really want. We want to explore the typical set of the uh, probability distribution because as we've seen on some lectures ago, this is where all the important information hides. And when we uh, explore the typical set, then we will be able to compute expectations, which is what we really want. And Markov chain, if generated properly, will be able to get to the typical set of our distribution uh, PQ that we are interested in and explore it properly. So that's our, our point. Because Markov chains have those stationary distributions, our point will be to generate a Markov chain that will have a desired stationary distribution. And this is possible on, in multiple ways and uh, we will cover one today and one on the HMC, um, HMC lecture. So which are that HMC, uh, AM, HMC one will be, let's say, less detailed than the one here. So because it's more, more, more difficult to understand. So generally the biggest point of here, and most of images, those red ones I'm using are lifted, are from the website of Michael Betancourt, all are linked here, so you can link uh, directly to, to the uh, case study provided in his website about Markov chains. I will add the link to a final GitHub version because I, I haven't it on the last slide. So generally, Markov chain converges uh, towards a typical set of the, uh, our distribution. So if it's uh, properly uh, defined Markov chain, it will go exactly where we want to, it to go because it will go towards its it, its samples will have uh, come from the uh, its stationary typical set will be a, a typical set of our distribution. And first of all, uh, the convergence to it uh, to the typical set is not it's rather fast, and 
after reaching this typical set, the Markov chain will explore it, so it will walk around it. So this is the uh, big advantage of the entire situation. And this is good for us. Why? Because using Markov chain, uh, we can clear, uh, create Markov uh, chain Monte Carlo estimators. Why Markov chain Monte Carlo? Because we are generating samples using Markov chains. So we are, and those are analogous to classical Monte Carlo. Uh, estimators, uh, because generally we construct them the same uh, as an expectation of certain function using averages of values of that function over the samples from given distribution. And considering that Markov chains are irreducible and aperiodic, uh, they are then recurrent and give, it ensures us the asymptotical consistency. So our estimator will converge to the uh, to the expectation of our function which is what well, the thing that we really want so that's where we go that's what we want uh, to obtain unfortunately this is only an asymptotic behavior so uh, as long as our number of samples rises to infinity then great but what with finite number of samples and we generally operate infinity domains. Uh, so, in the ideal case, our typical set is relatively well behaved, its shape is not difficult, so we will be considering how the we, co we are covering the typical set by the difference between the estimator and the actual expectation. And initial convergence, of course, it will be far away from our estimate. Why not? Because What's here is not a typical set. It won't. It won't estimate the, prop, the expectation properly. As we should remember, the expectation is generally uh, determined by the values of the distribution at the, the uh, by the points located in the typical set. However, when we start to move to other distribution, we are rather rapidly approaching the expected value of uh, actual expected value of our distribution uh, which is great uh, great situation because we are covering the typical set very well and getting samples from typical set leads us to appropriate points when we introduce more and more samples we will generally become asymptotically unbiased and we will we will get the um, uh, we will get a good estimate for our uh, estimate, uh, our estimator will be provide a good estimate for the expected value of our uh, uh, our function, which is the thing that we really wanted. So this is a good situation. First, we initialize our our, uh, our process. We are we get to the uh, typical set. We explore it, and after sufficient exploration, we get good estimate of anything. So that's how Monte Carlo computation really works. Uh, Problems arise with uh, with changes in geometry, and that's why I intended I wanted to discuss this topic here now, at least now it should be earlier, but issues um, because while we didn't have problems with simple models that we covered before, we asked we will, in our next lecture will be hierarchical models, and hierarchical models are very irregular. They is, uh, introduce multiple problems and we need to know where, why they are happening and where they are coming from. So that's why we will be, uh, we are discussing this here. So the problem with typical sets is that we can easily get the problems that happen also in the, uh, for example, in, in numerical optimization. Our set of constraints or our, our uh, special function can become very difficult to shape. They can, some, can some pinches, funnels, the points where the typical set becomes very thin. It, because of that, the exploration of it by Markov chain will be very difficult because our proposals of movement, our transitions, will not lead us to the right po points. It's something like when in optimization you had a gradient algorithm covering the banana valley. You had very, uh, very small steps that are not advancing towards the minimum and in this case we might have problems with exploring the typical set. Because while we reach it normally, we can start exploring it rather well. However, when we reach the problematic areas, 
then our problems will start because initially we'll be covering, of course, the expe our expectation to, to drop. However, when we reach the problematic region, then our iteration will start start to stick in certain uh, type points. And in case of optimization, when we were stuck in some kind of valley, it wasn't such a big problem. We just got a slow convergence, and we are not approaching the uh, minimum proper, uh, properly. However, in this case, our expectation will be biased and we will have issue that getting multiple samples into our average then will move us into improper uh, places of our uh, of our estimator. So our estimator will get the errors of uh, uh, like that's in uh, will overshoot in the value as we had in uh, using par parallel to control applications and it's not that it will be stuck forever because it is a random process and it's in randomly it will go away from that area finally but when we go into that area then unfortunately uh, we still have to buy the bias to uh, to overcompensate again using analog with control theory when we had the PID controller with without wind up when we uh, over integrated our uh, our control because of the saturation uh, when the integral is over uh, overfilled and it's, it's too large to, to to necessary situation after reducing the error after to a certain level we we are introducing the overshoot because we still have too much uh, values in the control in order to uh, in the integral in order to compensate for the situation that's why the issue of uh, uh, this is the same, the same kind of issue. We have too many samples in the average that are located into one point, and we we'll need to overcome this bias, and we'll overshoot again in the other uh, in the other uh, side. So uh, that's not only a source of problems because uh, problematic situations for sampling are also with multimodality. Uh, the first kind of problems that we have with geometry. They can't be diagnosed using certain methods uh, uh, in HMC. In uh, other cases, we need to cover, to analyze it more uh, in, in different ways. However, multimodality is a diff different problem because in, if our uh, typical set will be disjoint, which can happen if uh, our uh, probability distribution is multimodal and has multiple substantial modes that are other was maxima that will uh, be responsible for certain areas of uh, probability distributions, then our samples might be, uh, our uh, typical set might be disjoint and it has two areas that has to be covered. And the problem is that one of the modes can attract, or one of the disjoint parts of the typical set can attract the Markov chain and it will get to it and will start covering it. The same as in optimization, we will be drawn to a local minimum. In this case, we'll be uh, drawn to a part of the typical set, and unfortunately, the sampling will look rather properly, but the uh, estimator, of course, will be biased. We need to cover the entire typical set to get good expectation of our uh, our function. And again, don't think only as of expectation as uh, just an expectation of the distribution, because an expectation of a multimodal distribution won't say as much, but a, an expectation of certain function of this multimodal distribution might be exactly what we want. Um, and the, again, because it's a random process, we find after some time we will leave our typical set and we'll go to the, uh, this, the joint part of the typical set and we will jump to the other one and we'll start exploring that one. But again, it will take a lot of time to uh, leave something uh, that looked before like an equilibrium and to move into the uh, other part of typical settings, explore that. And we might consider that we've already been there. So that might be a problem. Uh, and uh, knowing that, how behaves, uh, how Markov chain behaves uh, uh, in uh, practice, we generally can consider the uh, so-called Markov chain Monte Carlo central limit theorem. Oh, sorry, this is something I've missed. Uh, because we uh, can again quantify standard, uh, our 
estimator using approximately Gaussian distribution. However, our formula for the standard error is different. Previously, we had it uh, given by variance and number of samples, and here we have something called effective sample size. So effective number of samples, it's either marked at ESS or by NFF, uh, so with N with superscript effective, depending on the source. Either way, we do not have the actual number of samples, but we have something called expect, uh, effective number of samples. And why is that? Because our Markov chain is not independent. Markov chains are autocorrelated in some kind of way. So not only samples depend by itself, but also there are similarities in the history. Sometimes it's that such autocorrelation can be big with uh, uh, periodic functions or something like that, when we can get substantial relationships but, uh, between them. In other cases, it might be lower. Either way, the expect expected number of samples is defined as the uh, number of total samples divided by the sum over all uh, like L autocorrelations. So the, uh, the normalized by, uh, so this is the unexpected value of our function uh, minus the empirical average. Uh, it's in given point and in the point uh, in the chain that is L samples away from it. So having a sequence, we can compute out the correlation of uh, those values by seeing how much is uh, similar to the values in the previous uh, previous points. And because it's an expectation, we are covering over the entire chain. So getting samples, we so uh, we, we are ex computing the average of this difference between all, uh, for example, first and second samples, second and third, and other like that. So we we are obtaining the expectation of our ch uh, of uh, our chain and its value, uh, previous value. So this is the auto autocorrelation function divided by the variance of the function in order to have it more or less normalized. So, as you can see, the more autocorrelation we have, the lower the number of effective samples. And in practice, oh, sorry, something got wrong. Uh, now it should be okay. Uh, in uh, practice, of course, we won't be computing an infinite number of autocorrelations. We will be computing them for the some number less than n, because of course uh, we cannot have it cannot be larger than n. So we will get a, some kind of constant that can be determined in one way or another. Usually we'll be relying on the uh, software to do it for us. So uh, we are because we are. Uh, uh, because of properties of autocorrelation, they are symmetric, so uh, we don't have to compute them from minus L to plus L. We just multiply by 2 uh, and compute it to L, and all those uh, autocorrelation coefficients are, of course, the uh, appropriate expectation estimators divided by the, uh, divided by the uh, variance estimator. So getting that, we'll, we'll get the uh, those autocorrelations to sum up and is gives us a practical expected sample size estimator. And what is the consequence of the expected sample size? Well, we have the general free cases. If our, all our samples that we have are independent from each other, then, uh, well, this is a great situation, there is no autocorrelation in our chain. If there's no autocorrelation, it generally becomes a true Monte Carlo sampler uh, because Monte Carlo requires from us that our samples will be independent from each other. So we are getting the independent samples and uh, the expected, uh, the est uh, effective sample size becomes equal to n. So we are getting exactly the same. Um, uh, all the samples are equally good. Anyway, uh, in case of uh, positive autocorrelations, uh, which are most of the cases generally, uh, we will have to uh, Get us to, we will have to uh, handle the aspect that we will have less effective sample size than n. 
So the mark of chain uh, Monte Carlo standard arrow will be greater than with the uh, than it would be for Monte Carlo uh, uh, estimator, but of course Monte Carlo estimator would we would not be able to compute it. So the situation is uh, unsolvable in this case. But now uh, this is something that happens. This is how it happens happens often. Uh, often we just need to be prepared for that. In there are special cases that when autocorrelations are negative which can happen and in such situation our effective sample size is uh, even greater because the it can get, become larger than l and so, this is not actually not something that we can really use because of course it might happen in certain situations but there are no practical methods of determining the uh, of determining uh, negatively calculated mark of chains that will uh, work for our purposes. So this is not something that we can do, and uh, even if we try, it's not numerically reliable. So that's why this is not something that is popular. But it's it's politically possible that we'll have the greater effective sample size than uh, actual number of samples we had before. So. That leads us to the estimated central limit theorem uh, in order to quantify the errors of our computation because uh, our we can approximately say that our estimator is distributed as a normal distribution with effective uh, with uh, a mean of uh, expectation of our function and so the standard error given by the uh, uh, square root of uh, the uh, fraction with estimated variance in the um, numerator and uh, effective sample size in the uh, denominator. Of course, all the problems that we've encountered in the Markov, uh, in the Monte Carlo uh, video was that there are cases when uh, certain limit theorem does not work when the functions that we want to obtain do not have defined uh, means on variances, so our, uh, our estimates will not be valid. But, so that's one, one of the methods of diagnosing our Markov chains behavior by evaluating the ineffective sample size. So we want possibly a little autocorrelation. But as we mentioned before, we are interested in the stationary distribution, the distribution that covers the typical set. Uh, uh, the typical set. So we want to know when we are in the typical set and what we can do with it. And again, in the ideal situation, we have some initialized samples, and then our samples are located around certain values and just are oscillating in multiple dimensions. There would be multiple. These calls are these are called trace plots. Those trace plots are. Uh, present in all those uh, for for you can consider for all chains for all vari variables of uh, to see how how they behave and because of that we can determine if we could we should determine if the uh, chain is stationary and that would be great that's the the main point that that would be great unfortunately of course uh, not all cases are ideal. Uh, First of all, the problem is, uh, can happen with freezing. Freezing is something that really we really do not want to have. This is something when uh, our samples get stuck in these pinches in the function, some kind of geometrical uh, behavior that uh, we could be stuck in and uh, not be able to get away from that. And because of periods of constant values, uh, or almost constant, the estimator will be biased, and that's that's the problem. So certainly we have not obtained the samples from the entire stationary distribution, which might be a problem. And the biggest problem is that if our chain is short, it might not actually be able to. Uh, we may not be able to determine that we have. Uh, Avoided the uh, the difficult geometry by not sampling the entire typical set, so that might be a problematic situation that we need to be prepared for. Uh, also, the problematic situation can be with multimodal distribution because 
when we have multiple modes, a lot of a lot can change by the through the initial point of uh, Markov chain, because we can start of course with zero, but we can also start with different values. And if we start with different values, it might converge uh, converge to the different part of the typical set, especially with those typical sets are disjoint. So different initialization will generate us completely different uh, sequence of samples and that on the other uh, that will lead to different kind of biases and it will be generally a problem so this is not something that we really want to have and because of that well what we can do well the easiest point is multiply the number of chains so get more chains of your distribution and uh, sample it from multiple parts so then you can see okay those chains get different expected values so there is a problem there is a problem because um, we have multimodality we have to handle it moreover we are getting multiple samples from the distribution starting from different points so we get more samples and having more samples improves our predictions uh, or our, our estimations and that's generally a good point no of course we don't need to go crazy. There are some ideas, well, we need sh should parallelize the computation, let's say have 4 million chains and it will be great. Usually it's not needed. Uh, multiple chain, yes. Uh, the rule of thumb that I've seen in, for example, in Stan is that uh, Stan actually has a default of 4. Why? Because uh, when it was being developed, most of the uh, processors had four cores, so we could you could easily parallelize this computation that each uh, chain was sampled independently on uh, on different cores, and uh, otherwise, of course, you can detect cores and detect number of chain uh, assign this number of chains. You can do it multiple. Ways. So, having said that, getting multiple chains is is always good because it gives you better exploration of your distribution. And unless you uh, you initialize them really badly, uh, few of them you will usually be okay in order to quantify all the behavior. And if you have a really bad pathological distribution, even getting hundreds of thou or thousands of uh, chains won't help anything because you get stuck in places that you won't be able to unstuck reliably. Uh, also, when you are doing multiple chains, you are also able to determine the problems. For example, you can uh, uh, in certain points you get into freezing, in other don't. So this is something that you need to be uh, also be able to consider that getting multiple chains help you in diagnostics. And so there are multiple tools to analyze multiple chains results. We may might be, maybe maybe we'll, I will show you to you with the lecture for HMC where we will be using a fully com full computation uh, analysis. Generally, multiple chains help. So getting multiple chains is always better than one chain and uh, it gets you the uh, possibility to diagnose or detect certain aspects, problematic aspects. Uh, and multi-chain diagnostics, uh, multi having multiple chains allows you to do some quanti uh, quantity, qualitative and quantitative diagnostics. Qualitative diagnostics you can do by uh, generally viewing the trace plots of, of chains and seeing is there something happening there. And this is of course not a good idea, it's not a bad idea, but sometimes you have so many variables that it will, it will be very difficult. It will be very difficult to reliably check all the chains and moreover not everything can be seen for um, that. That's why multiple diagnostics were introduced. Uh, we start with the diagnostics that are needed for the um, RHAT uh, statistic because generally multi, uh, uh, we can see our chains that all our chains should generate behavior that is consistent among all of them. So if in, the, in the ideal situation when we have for example four chains, all those chains should be able to, uh, all, all those chains should be uh, an, uh, an option for uh, like uh, all those chains should explore the same typical sets so having samples for the, all those chains it generally it, they should be indistinguishable from each other if there is no problem all those chains are very very similar at least statistically speaking that's why we can compare within chain variance so the 
empirical average of this uh, of the all squares of, of, uh, of standard errors in all, all those chains over all chains and and between chains uh, uh, chain variance so how uh, estimators itself are varying computed for each of the chains so that gives us the uh, two values generally between chain and within chain variance should be similar and for that we introduce the air hat statistic air hat statistic is one of the most important statistics in bayesian computation uh, for diagnostics because it generally uh, it's called potential skill reduction factor and it analyzes how the um, uh, chains are mixing with each other so, uh, so how they, well they are covering the uh, typical set in case of uh, a hat this statistic is generally introduces the quotient of between chain and within chain variances if they are equal then r hat reduces to one which is the optimal situation if chains get the same equilibrium r hat should be equal to one this formula for a hat is currently being replaced by a different one it's still the uh, potential scale reduction factor but it's been modified to intro to cover situations with more difficult tails but we won't be diverging to that i recommend reading item uh, either betancourt's um, uh, case study i'm borrowing heavily here from our different um, uh, our different materials so uh, i will I, again add a link for uh, for relevant information in the uh, in the last slide which i will push, push on github uh, different uh, method of analyzing the chains is GWIKI statistic and this is generally a very simple idea that if our chain is the uh, is w covering the initial uh, the, the typical set then it shouldn't matter if we are on the beginning of that chain or at the end of this ch uh, chain although estimators should be similar so generally if G is equal to zero, then our um, then our uh, chain is well uh, representing the our uh, our typical set because I, uh, it's uh, independent. It's, we go from front on to the end of the Markov chain. We get some. We get the same information, and practically we are using statistic that is being uh, the statistic that is, is being used for the uh, that statistic that is used for uh, the in practical computation is called splitter hat and splitter hat is like let's say best of both worlds because it will it diagnoses both the aspect of uh, uh, between chains va uh, variance and the aspect of within chain uh, beginning and the end and uh, excuse me for a moment like someone is really bothering me wait a second Baranowski przepraszam nie mogę teraz rozmawiać mam prawdę wykład ze studentami odzwonię ok uh, sorry for that. Squad uh, budowlane. Generally, uh, what we've uh, what Splitter Hat is doing is that it's uh, uh, it takes the Markov chain that we are analyzing, uh, or all the Markov chains that we have, and splits them in half. So it kind of gives you from the, for example from four chains you get eight chains and computes. Uh, R hat over all of them and that is better because in a way because it allows you to compare also the beginning and the end of the chain so R hat and we will be considering split R hat as R, we will be discussing R, uh, in, in case of R hat in most competition is always split R hat is the one of the basics for uh, analysis if R hat is significantly different than one something is bad with our computation and but what about initialization? Because we are discussing the uh, behavior of the chain in the typical set, but uh, we all know that there is this initialization period. We start from somewhere and we are approaching the typical set. And generally, uh, 
we need to drop some of samples. First, in, traditionally it was called burn in, that there are samples that are just being thrown away or burned away and we didn't record. Now it's called, uh, called warm up, which has more positive connotation, like the algorithm warms up to proper operation. And generally, we have three options of uh, warm, uh, warm up. Theoretically, we should, the warm up should happen after initialization. If we know how fast uh, the uh, chain converges to typical set, then we just drop those samples. For that. Of course, that might be a problematic to determine. So maybe the option is adaptive. Uh, adaptive warm up has an, the idea of adaptive warm up is that we are just checking the samples of um, uh, we are checking the samples uh, from the. Uh, Markov chain, we are analyzing them and we are deciding, okay, this looks like we've obtained, we've gotten a typical set, we are dropping everything before that. And practically, we are using heuristic of things. And heuristic is just we set a, set a fixed number of iterations that we are dropping, and that's it. Def default value is that for, uh, the, uh, uh, for example, in Stan. Uh, the, the, by default, we are getting uh, 1,000 samples from each of the each of chains, and 1,000 of samples uh, uh, for each chain is a war also a warm up. So we just get, get 8,000 samples, but we keep only 4,000 of them. And this is the default. We can change that, of course, if we want to uh, to get the uh, uh, to get some better results if necessary. And. Coming from that, we want to get the um, uh, method of determining the uh, Markov chain. And we are getting to the one of the most important algorithms of 20th century. This was a ranking uh, in, by Siam. This is the uh, very important uh, or prestigious uh, organization of mathematicians. Uh, they've uh, considered what were the most influential algorithms of the uh, 20th century. And uh, among those algorithms were Quicksort, Fast Fourier Transform, and Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Because Metropolis Hastings algorithm is a general framework for generating the. Uh, for generating uh, Markov chains with fixed uh, stationary distribution that we want. And uh, based on that, we can build more complicated algorithms. <coughs> but the general idea is still the same: uh, to act, uh, to accept or, uh, or disregard certain distribution. Because the main problem, again, with sampling, is that it's hard to get samples from any arbitrary distributions. There are some distributions that we can sample easily. For example, normal distributions or one-dimensional distributions, this is very easy. In case of multi-dimensional uh, complicated distribution, that's a problematic situation. So, idea of Metropolitan Hastings algorithm is that we find a proposal distribution. Proposal distribution is a distribution that we can easily sample from. For example, usually, it's a, often it's a normal distribution, it can be some, something else. Uh, generally, the Metropolis Hastings uh, algorithm is the uh, uh, the idea of Metropolis Hastings algorithm is to obtain so-called acceptance probability. So to determine how wh when we can accept the, our proposal from this normal distribution that we have, uh, and when we had to uh, and uh, uh, and when we shouldn't and. It is obtained by some so-called uh, metropolis Hastings acceptance probability, which is the uh, minimum of, of either uh, one or certain fraction. And this fraction is uh, the quotient of our inter probability distribution that we existed in in the proposed point and in the previous point, and the our proposal distribution. In the nominate, uh, in the numerator, it's the uh, probability of going to Q when we have the uh, when we have the um, Q prime uh, as our current point, and in the de uh, uh, denominator, uh, opposite to that. If our distribution is symmetrical, for example, normal, 
uh, then it doesn't matter and this part can be dropped. If it's not uh, proposition is not symmetrical, then you have to compute both ways. Either way, the idea of Metropolis algorithm is that we are generating a proposal, then from that propo uh, for that proposal we compute this acceptance probability, and then we get a, uh, uh, we, we conduct a random decision with that probability. So we generate a random number between zero and one. If it's lower than the acceptance probability, then we accept our proposal. If uh, it's higher, then we will uh, then we will be uh, moving from the uh, but we will be moving away from we will stay at the same point. <coughs> Generally, the idea, as you can look at this, if the especially with a symmetric distribution, if we move to the areas of greater probability distribution, so when the density is greater, because remember, density, probability density function is just a real value num function from, uh, uh, from any, any vector, so if our point increases the density, it is accepted with the probability of 1. If, however, it does not increase the probability, it reduces it, it is accepted, but depending on how much it re the re reduction is happening. So, generally, we are moving to the areas of higher probability, and that leads us to the typical, and that covers the typical set. The proposal, often propos used proposal, on the what was the basic proposal, is using no normal, and th that gives us the uh, so-called random walk, <coughs> random walk metropolis algorithm. Just to be visible later, uh, so it's a random uh, uh, when our proposal function is just a multinomial, uh, it's a multi uh, uh, multivariate uh, normal distribution with some covariance matrix and which moves around our points, and that's the the main idea of uh, metropolis casting algorithm, which will be able to generate samples and cover them over the entire. Uh, hopefully enter a typical set. And let's move to some examples so we can uh, see what's going on. We will first start with a relatively simple distribution, it's a normal distribution. Uh, in this case, so given in a, no, in a logarithmic form, we will be using logarithmic form of our distributions to avoid numerical errors. <coughs> we just compute the... It's a normal distribution with a mean of uh, or for the first var first variable is uh, uh, centered in minus one, the second one is uh, uh, in uh, sorry in one, and uh, second one is, is centered in minus one. This is the uh, we have a sigma. Uh, this is a logarithm of two p. We have this uh, the sigma value of two. So uh, we have the uh, so generally our algorithm is uh, uh, is a, it's just a normal distribution specified as a logarithm. Uh, and of course its uh, contour plot is a normal, uh, is uh, concentric circles uh, uh, with a middle in minus one one. So it's here. A very simple distribution will be simple to cover and we will be uh, doing 5000 transitions uh, our two-dimensional functions. We will assign our sigma uh, for our proposal distribution to be 1.4. And uh, here is our uh, brutally coded uh, uh, metropolis algorithm, which looks like this. We start with some kind of random point at the initial way. So our first row is, uh, and fir first d columns are given by the just a random normal uh, sample. Uh, and uh, this is our first. Uh, uh, this is our first sample. Uh, so uh, this is our acceptance probability. This uh, acceptance probability is of course one because we started with one. It will be useful for uh, for potential di diagnostics. So what we are doing here is that we are in a loop. After transitions, we start from our initial point that we've taken from our 
our loop with sample a point located in this initial point. <coughs> then we compute the acceptance probability using our formula because again we had the uh, we had a normal using a normal proposal. Uh, distribution we have no issue with that is symmetrical so we can cancel that because we use logarithmic form we can uh, we instead of dividing two exponents by each other we just uh, get an exponent of the uh, of their difference and uh, we assign this accept we save this acceptance probability for uh, in our uh, in our ma uh, matrix and then decide our decision depending on uh, acceptance probability, we get a random unif uniformly, uh, uniformly distributed random number and we compare it to our acceptance probability. If probability is greater than you, then we uh, assign this new proposal as our new, uh, new point. If uh, not, we stay in the same place. So, if the movement would be <coughs> very difficult, we'll be stuck in the Q0 point. And sorry, I haven't skipped something. That will be repaired in a moment. Okay. Okay. So we can compute. This is a function that I wrote. So you can find it on GitHub it's called MC Stats, which will just compute those things that we are interested in here. So look at it like how uh, how it's uh, how the situation looks like. First of all, uh, our uh, estimates were relatively correct because we got the uh, well we covered the uh, intervals pr uh, properly we got uh, here our vinyl, uh, our estimate is uh, uh, centered around actual values with standard deviations of one so it's covered uh, both or around one as you can see Monte Carlo standard errors are relatively small around uh, uh, 0.03 because in this case it's uh, because of our values are close to one it's uh, uh, irrelevant are we considering it as values of uh, relative or absolute either way they are around three uh, percent uh, with acceptance probability this uh, estimator doesn't is not that important however we can see that on average we accepted 42 percent of our steps so, and our acceptance probability will change here, and our split error hats are uh, equal to one. So our initial chain with actually 100 warm-up iterations. So we just only drop 100 samples. Uh, were uh, very uh, well, well, well covering our typical set. However, as you can see, effective sample size is very uh, is around uh, 600 so it's less than 20 percent of all samples uh, computed and why is that it's happened because we get strong autocorrelations in situations when we have uh, rejected samples if samples uh, if, if proposals are rejected then uh, of course uh, Effect, those samples, well, there's actually natural interpretation of effective sample size. A lot of samples being rejected, then the estimated sample size is good. And also because of the correlations that happens naturally in, uh, autocorrelation happens naturally in Markov chains, then again, it, it accumulates together. So both uh, adding rejections and the, uh, value, uh, and the values is the uh, effective size. Uh, uh, changes the effective sample size. Uh, we do not need to look at these these values for acceptance probability, but at least not MCSE, SSS, or split and hat because those are like they are computed because we're in the table, but they are not that relevant. But we can see from that there is some negative autocorrelation in the acceptance probability uh, in that uh, in acceptance probability uh, history. So. We can look at our estimates. As we can see, we can get some kind of coverage of our and with uh, our mean with the uh, Monte Carlo standard error is close to our values of interest. 
we are not plotting an actual standard error and uh, confident interval here. This is only the Monte Carlo standard error of our mean. So how our mean is away from our campus. Again, after some initialization, we get Monte Carlo standard error small and mean is well representing our data set. Our, our, no, this is our, but our, our model. Uh, okay, and to um, again, again, I've dropped the the ball here because here should be a separate slide. Uh, returning that, we can see what's happening here is that how exploration of our data set looks. Starting with our first 100 samples, we just got into the tip, uh, the, uh, the, the the typical set, and then after. Uh, subsequent number of samples, we get better and better coverage of it. So, generally, that's how be, uh, how our model behaved here. Uh, and as a summary, we can add a kernel density estimator of our samples, which also is kind of similar to our uh, our set. Of course, this has all the faults of kernel density estimators compared to histograms, but it's uh, a useful visualization of 2D. Uh, uh, of to the uh, uh, to the sample set, so it has some issues and it should be more regular because generally it comes from normal distribution, but is it is what it is. It's uh, uh, so that was a simple case without any issue. Here we have a more difficult situation. We have a situation when uh, our uh, something set is uh, much more uh, geometrically complicated, but I see that we are at one, and I think that we will break at this moment, and I will uh, cover those examples together with Hamilton and Monte Carlo later in a separate video uh, during the weekend. Are there any questions for now for what was covered today? You can ask on Teams or you can ask on the chat. If there are no questions, I just ask on the chat for. If there are no questions, then see you on the next video over the weekend. Thank you very much and have a nice day.